Thank you so much for joining us today for the joint launch of the book, The Music of Our Burnished Axes, as well as the traveling exhibit, uh, Songs and Stories of the Forgotten Service. Um, I'm Alison Carr of Vicer Books, and it is my very pleasant task today to tell you a little bit about the book um, and introduce you to the authors of the important volume and exhibit we are here today to celebrate. First, the book. Um, Icer Books has been publishing social, economic, and cultural research about the North Atlantic region since the 1960s, and it has been our distinct honor to add this remarkable book, The Music of Our Burnished Axes, Songs and Stories of the Woods Workers of Newfoundland and Labrador, to our list of titles. The care and attention to detail the authors put into their research, writing, and tra transcription is truly extraordinary. They've created a cultural artifact that is an important addition to the existing literature of Newfoundland and Labrador history and cultural studies. This book is the first comprehensive collection of musical compositions, recitations, poems, and narratives written by, for, and about 20th century woods workers in Newfoundland and Labrador. This very rich account does not simply capture the materials contained within it, but gives voice to the woods workers and their families, painting an intimate portrait of community and way of life. The book itself is di divided into parts, songs, recitations, poems, and first person accounts. And today we will have the pleasure of hearing some live performances from each of these sections. Uh, the authors will introduce each of these performers and then tell you a little bit about their exhibit. Um, so now seems like a pretty good time to introduce the authors. Uh, Ursula Kelly is a, pro a professor in the Faculty of Education at Memorial University. Her areas of specialization are cultural studies, critical education, and critical literacies. She's published many volumes on these subjects, her most recent project being Mentioned in Song, a CD and booklet about the musical traditions of loggers in Newfoundland and Labrador, which we have available for sale along with the book outside in the hallway. Um, Megan, Forth Megan Forsythe is an ethnomusicologist specializing in the instrumental music and dance traditions of the Acadian diaspora. She is director of the Bruno Center for Excellence in Choral Music, project coordinator and researcher for the Research Center for the Study of Music, Media, and Place, and MAP, um, and a lecturer in ethnomusicology and popular music at Memorial. She's also curator of Danse, an award-winning interactive multimedia ex exhibition and website on Acadian dance. Congratulations, Megan and Ursula, on all your hard work on this extraordinary book and exhibit. Please. Thank you, Alison. Um, it's a really exciting day for Megan and me, and we are very happy so many of you have come out to share it with us. Um, Megan and my collaboration began in 2014 with uh, mentioned in Song, Song Traditions of Loggers of Newfoundland and Labrador, 27 track CD and booklet set produced at the Research Center for the Study of Music, Media, and Place. It is the first and only compilation of locally composed songs of the woods workers of this province. We have been very busy ever since. <laughs> we like each other too. <laughs> or I think she likes me. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> Together we have made several multimedia presentations about the songs and stories of our woods workers and communities throughout the province and in Scotland. Our objective is to highlight this cultural legacy and contribute to its accessibility and revitalization. But there were many more songs than a CD could hold and many special stories, woods work in Labrador, strikes and lockouts, the work of women in camps, and the overseas forestry service service during the war as examples that needed to be told. Our book, The Music of Our Burnished Axes, and our exhibit, The Songs and Stories of the Forgotten Service, attest to what is a very productive and satisfying research partnership dedicated to remembering and sharing these songs and stories. Megan is an ethnomusicologist, and I'm an interdisciplinary scholar of cultural studies. For these projects, we were a perfect fit. I also have a personal connection to the focus of our research. My father was a foreman for the Anglo-Newfoundland Development Company, the A&D Company, at several of our logging camps around Gambo. 
As a young child in late 1950s Gambo, Newfoundland, I had little understanding of his work. I knew that his job took him away from home, and I missed him dearly. Up over the road, as we called it, to the woods camps for extended periods, where on a Saturday my family sometimes joined him. These visits left me with joy-filled memories of berry picking, swimming, fishing, and other woods adventures, of kind men who whistled and sang as they worked and who took the time to talk to me and teach me things, and of good cooks who produced pies and other treats in abundance. Most of all, there was the van. Now, for those of you who don't know what the van is, it's kind of like the logger's mini convenience store. <laughs> the van, a place of a seemingly endless supply of chocolate bars and chewing gum, <laughs> to which my dad held the key. <laughs> These small pleasures of childhood left a memorable, if very partial, impression of what it meant to have a father who worked in the woods. Decades passed before I looked for a semblance of the remembered joys of days at my father's camps. As a child, I could not know and appreciate the big story of which my father's life and those of other loggers in Gambo and its nearby communities were a part. But as I researched and compiled the selections that form this book, I was struck by the significance of the story and moved by the vitality and courage of the workers who were its key players. At a macro level, this story is not only one of Wood's work, lumbering and logging, but also of competing interest and strife and change. Harvesting forests disrupted and altered the lands and lifeways of indigenous peoples. As well, settler fishers who seasonally harvested wood to support their trade became fisher loggers for whom logging was fall and winter waged work, a very own unusual thing in Newfoundland at the time. Many also became full-time loggers in this new industry and migrated to build new communities at their places of work. Always. They had to struggle for decent working conditions and a living wage to support their families. Some glimpses of the big story of Wood's work can be found in history books that narrate and analyze industrialization efforts on the island of Newfoundland and Labrador. But such accounts rarely include the voices of the Wood's workers who were the backbone of the story and who were wrongly dismissed as poor and uneducated and of value only for their physical strength and endurance. The songs, recitations, poems, and stories they composed about their work challenge the stereotype and show how exploitation and hardship were met with grit, determination, creativity, and humor. But theirs was a fragile legacy. Few of the songs had been popularized or were easily accessible to the public. The quality of the recordings that did exist deteriorating over time. There were few available transcriptions of songs and tunes, and those with first-hand knowledge of the tradition were passing. On the library bookshelves or in the digital spaces where one could find the collections and studies of the songs of woodworkers from other parts of Canada and the United States, there was no similar volume about the woods workers of Newfoundland and Labrador. It is the purpose of our book to correct this historic omission, and despite the challenges created by the passage of time, to make available in a single volume the voices of the woods workers as heard through their own occupational songs, recitations, poems, and stories. Taken together, they are a significant and un until now largely unknown grassroots record of an until then unprecedented time in the history of Newfoundland and Labrador when residents turned from the sea to the land to harvest the forest and to participate in an era of industrialization that would change the face of their small country. Woods workers sang many kinds of songs that drew from the broader available repertoire of English, Irish, Scottish, French, American, and Canadian folk songs. The primary focus of this book, however, is the tradition of song, music, and story within Woods culture that takes as, it direct, as its direct subject the work of logging, lumbering, and personal woodcutting for family fuel. 
Millwork is also included, but the contexts of millwork and woodswork differed significantly, and these differences shaped their expressive culture, including opportunities for song making and singing. A song was often composed in a bunkhouse or kitchen, or in the woods, or on a pond, usually spontaneously and on the spot, and sometimes collectively. A song resonated because of the story it told, and it spread through the keenness of memory that characterizes the oral tradition. The musical features of the songs and tunes collected in this volume reflect the participatory and communal nature of the work and social life in the woods camps. As with other forms of creative expression they practiced, woods workers used songs and tunes to pass time spent away from family and escape the drudgery of camp life. Song lyrics and tunes also served as a way for woods workers to memorialize people and places and document events and common experiences. The music was sometimes sung or played by one individual in a bunkhouse or hall for the entertainment of others. More frequently, musical performances were experienced as a form of participatory culture that defined work and camp life. Songs were created and sung by any and all members of the industry who had something to say, and they did have something to say. The familiar opening phrase of many of the ballads, Come All Ye, invites listeners to settle in and lend their ears to a good story, while memorable choruses create a space for listeners to sing, tap, or play along. The number of available compositions, there are 76 locally composed songs and tunes that are included in the book, suggests the extent to which woods workers wanted to tell their stories. Songs and stories, like the hard work, encouraged connection. They allowed anyone who wished to participate to sing along or to tap a hand or foot in time, or during composition to add a line or a stanza from one's own particular vantage point and experience. Moniker songs acknowledged individuality and built camaraderie. Songs also show the tensions and differences among workers, the relations of power that underscored the work, and the workers' understandings of the hierarchies that shaped their lives. We're thrilled to have Jim Payne with us today to perform a wood song written early in the 20th century when the pulp and paper industry was still new. Jim is one of the province's most prolific songwriters, a wonderful singer of traditional songs, a storyteller, a writer, an actor, an instructor, an entrepreneur, an instrumentalist, and a caller of Newfoundland set dances. He's gonna hate me for saying all this. He was also one of the many local knowledge holders who helped us throughout the book project. Twin Lakes is a cautionary tale about early 20th century woods work in Newfoundland and Labrador that was likely written in the early 1920s. And here's Jim to perform it. Okay, thank you, Megan, for that uh, introduction there. Uh, I guess this book really puts the lie to the, uh, the line in the song, The Badger Drive, about how they're seldom mentioned in song. It was 76 or something like that? Yeah. That's great. Uh, the Twin Lakes, uh, for those of you who don't know, would be found in, in, in the Badger Bay, really, uh, within Notre Dame Bay and back in the woods, and was one of the places where the A&D company had camps. And the, the, the song itself is about the, uh, the subcontractor. So loggers, instead of being actually... Uh, hired directly by the A&D company, uh, they would hire subcontractors who had a contract to, to supply so many cords of wood. And uh, th that's a practice that still uh, goes on with uh, uh, paper companies and people who supply wood to paper companies. Uh, I come from a family of loggers and fisher loggers, as Ursa described them. Uh, my father and a bunch of uncles were loggers, and my gran both my grandfathers were cooks. And just like uh, Ursa talking about the van, it was really great to be able to go sometimes into the logging camps, uh, into the cookhouse, because uh, the, the goodies were many and varied, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, the, the, the Twin Lakes. I worked as a subcontractor the summer I turned 17 uh, with my father and a bunch of other men to supply uh, uh, lumber for the, for the liner board mill in, uh, in Stephenville. Uh, doesn't go back quite as far as uh, this particular song, uh, but it goes like this. As I was sitting in my own cozy corner, thinking all on a few dollars to make, my wife says to me, why don't you try subbing? They're making good wages up on the Twin Lakes. 
The answer I gave, I don't know out about it For I don't want the A and D company to break I'm afraid they won't find enough money to pay me If I get some months subbing up on the Twin Lakes I started for Twin Lakes late up in November Thoughts of the subbing would make your heart ache I got in some firewood, packed me old kit bag Started right off for the shores of Twin Lakes I arrived at the camp on a fine Sunday evening About four o'clock if I make no mistake The bunks were all filled so I slept on the table That's how I spent my first night up on Twin Lakes Some men in their sleep they were piling up timber Others were shouting pass down the shortcake And all kinds of nonsense I cannot remember The boys they were using on the shores at Twin Lakes It's up in the morning in a very good humor Out in the four-peak a box ought to take A chance of good timber I heard in the rumor It could not be found on the shores of Twin Lakes it's out in the woods with a box on measure Work like a slave, small wages to make If you want any money, you'll have to quit subbing You'll get no more show on the shores of Twin Lakes Two dollars they'll pay you for piling up timber Then eighteen dollars for board they will take And then they will charge six dollars for blankets And that's how you're soaked on the shores of Twin Lakes Look at those contractors, see how they will nip you They'll keep you right down with their foot on your neck If you want a good show and plenty of timber You better keep clear of the shores at Twin Lakes All you young men who are seeking employment Heed a poor subber's warning and make no mistake Get aboard the express and go across the island And try and keep clear of the shores at Twin Lakes Come all you young women seeking a husband Heed a poor subber's warning before it's too late If you want a good home and plenty of money Don't marry a subber subs on the Twin Lakes Come all you young peddlers who stand round your counter Waiting a poor subber's money to take And when you sit down to your fresh pork and cabbage Just think on the subber subs on the Twin Lakes Twin Lakes, thank you. We can add logger to the list around Jim now. <laughs> Jim, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. In the woods camps of the first half of the 20th century, there were poets and song makers from many communities who documented their experiences and entertained themselves by sharing their compositions at camp. Just imagine that scene playing out in a bunkhouse. There are 23 such poems included in the book. Poems were written to describe day-to-day -day work and worries, as well as shared pleasures and camaraderie. Some, sometimes what began as a poem eventually became a song. As one logger explained, someone would make up a poem and they'd sing it, or someone else would make up a tune to it. Ralph Young, who was born in Millertown, moved to Deer Lake, where he worked as a logger for 47 years. He wrote many poems and is described by his daughter, Julie Boulding, as a logger by trade and a poet by heart. Regrettably, Ralph Young passed in early 2018, just months before two of his poems were published in our book. <coughs> it is our great pleasure, our great pleasure, to have his daughter, Julie, with us today to read one of his poems entitled, Safety First. Julie. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to extend my congratulations to Herschel and Megan.
for their research and interest in this industry, the logging industry, which resulted in this wonderful book. This gives men like my dad, who worked as a logger for 47 years, a voice and a well-deserved value for their extremely hard labor. And I might mention that my dad worked for 47 years and never received a company pension. They weren't deemed important enough. <clears throat> I think it's important the message to this book not only documents the history in the logging industry, which you've so wonderfully done, but it puts emphasis on the important role the woodsman played in building our society. And Ursula, I know that you <coughs> already said this, but I think it's worthy of saying again, but one of the things that struck me is when you read it, I'm reading an excerpt from our book, it says, but such accounts rarely include the voices of the woods workers who were the backbone of the story and were often wrongly dismissed as poor and uneducated and of value only for their physical strength and endurance. And that's the way it was. I think that, that I, I'm, I personally am very happy that this book um, will be remembered long after they are gone, it re their work will be remembered. My dad passed away earlier this year at the ripe old age of 93. He was often heard saying, it takes a tough man to be a woodsman, but hard work will never kill anyone. One of his pastimes was writing poetry, or rhymes as he called it. Dad wasn't very educated, and uh, he didn't always uh, say things correctly, but he always loved to write poetry. And I'm most sure when he was writing his poems, he never imagined in his wildest <laughs> dreams that a couple of them would get published in a book. <laughs> I just regret that he didn't live to see this book. However, he did live to see Ursula's book, Mentioned in Sign, which had a couple of verses from his poem, The Valley. And this book is pretty old, and it well, was not old, but it looks old, and it's pretty in bad shape. The first eight pages is actually missing, but the page that's not missing is page 26, and that's where his poem was. And my father suffered with dementia the last couple of years of his life. But let me tell you, he always knew this book. He always held it to his chest. And we often would find him, we'd go into his room, and he would be asleep with this book across his chest, sound asleep. And it was always open to page 26. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm just, if, if I may, I'm just going to read the last two verses of, the, of that poem called The Valley. It was, he was speaking of the Humber Valley and, and where he worked. And the last couple of verses goes like this. I wonder at the peace in this valley and the beauty that's hard to believe. I wish I could share in its secret before I make ready to leave. And now it's farewell to the mountain. With regret, I'm leaving for town. But I'll never forget the experience of a heaven on earth that I found. The book, I guess that poem, depicts the fact that even though he worked in a very harsh and demanding work environment, he often found a tranquility in the nature around him. So he always, he never complained, you know, about his job, but he always, he took the best from it. And he always loved the woods and the environment that he worked in, even though it was very harsh. The poem I'm reading today is entitled, I shouldn't mention this to Ursula, that this little book gave my father the last couple of years of his life, he was very proud, so you can be sure that uh, you, know, you contributed to the happy and proud moments of an old woodsman. <laughs> but the poem that I'm going to read today is entitled Safety First, and it's found on page 337 of, of this wonderful book, Music of Our Burnished Taxes. He suffered a life-threatening injury when a tree fell on him. 
So safety was very important to my dad. And he, he suffered that injury because of an unsafe measure by a junior worker. He was laid out for many months in the hospital and he was told by medical people that he would never work in that woods environment again. However, that was my father's only skill set. That's all he knew. And he knew he had to go back. So with a broken knee, he went back again as a lager. And he remained there until he was 65 years old. So by putting safety first was definitely his ticket to old age. So I'm going to read his poem, Safety First. On one Friday evening in the year of 72, I attended a safety meeting by a Lager safety crew. Concerned about the mishap that could happen every day, we sat back to listen to what the foreman had to say. Last year was a bad year. This one may be worse. We'll have to be more careful and practice safety first. Always wear your safety hat and your pads upon your knee. Give a good example for the other guy to see. If you use your power saw for sawing overhead, you could lose your balance and saw yourself instead. <laughs> Back sawing is a habit that you should never do. The chances that you take could saw your legs in two. Your power saw can be dangerous, so use it with respect. It's foolish to have an accident for something you neglect. Before you push a bigger tree that's maybe leaning back, take time to use a pull. It's easier on the back. Be wary of that hanging tree and exercise your skill. Not only do they cripple, but they have been known to kill. Sometimes you have to work in really rough terrain. Be careful of windfalls made slippery by the rain. There are many laggers that are masters of their trade, sometimes a little reckless when there's money to be made. If you drive a timberjack and things are looking good, be sure your cutter is safe before wincing in the wood. I have spoken of many hazards, and some I have left out. To prevent another mishap is what this meeting was about. There are many meetings by every safety crew, but to eliminate the accidents, it's really up to you. So thank you, Hersla, for giving me the opportunity to share my father's poem. And I have no doubt that this book will provide a great legacy for the woodsmen and their families like myself. The book includes many stories about early lumbering and logging. Several longer narratives are included that represent key experiences through a century of woods work. One of the lesser known stories that emerged through this research provided glimpses of the role of women in the industry. Women were essential to the economy of lumbering and logging. They tended to all aspects of house and home, including preparing the family wood supply, especially during periods when the men were in camp. In rare instances, women were at the center of Woods Enterprises, as was the case with Catherine Murphy and Zipporah, or Zippy, Steele of Glenwood, the first women lumber mill owners. And while it was not widely known, women also had key roles in logging camp life. Women sometimes accompanied their husbands and cooked and cared for the children at camp. Some worked as office clerks or serving girls. Sometimes children were born at camp. In many family camps, a teacher, often a woman, was hired to instruct young children. In mill towns, such as those at Grand Lake, a uh, Grand Village, Mud Lake, Labrador, the building of a school was a priority, along with the church and the company store. There are a few stories about women and children and their experience in woods camps. In one of the 10 first-person narratives included in the book, Amy Payne Nicole of Gads Harbor, Bombay, documented from a child's perspective a delightful and de uh, detailed account of life in one of her family's camps at North, or in her family's camps at North Lake and Plum Point. Nicole, whose education began in camp at Plum Point, eventually became a teacher. We're delighted to have Amy Payne, Nicole's daughter, Lauren Major, and her granddaughter, Andrea Major, here with us tonight to read an excerpt of one of Amy's, uh, of Amy's account entitled Childhood in a Newfoundland Logging Camp. My first schooling. There were several, several children at Plum Point, and that was what made me feel happy, but sad too, because Plum Point had no school and I had reached the age of seven, the requirement age for school. 
When the Anglican minister at Flowers Cove visited the community, Dad asked him about the possibility of school. He promised to get a teacher if space could be found for a classroom. Space was provided. It was an upstairs bedroom in the company house in which we lived. Our family provided free board, and the other families of Plum Point made up $10 per month for a salary. One day, the children and I went upstairs to the spare room to play. We soon got tired of playing with, dissol with dolls and decided that since this room was going to be our school, it would be nice to paint the floor. <laughs> there were a few tins partly filled with paint and brushes. We started at one end and gradually worked our way along with very pretty colored blocks. Square blocks were what we were aiming for, but some came off a little off course. However, we were having a lovely time and so proud of our brightly colored blocks until we were discovered and found out that our lovely job was not so lovely after all. We were wasting paint. It was a terrible setback for us to find out that our work was not appreciated. Eventually, our pretty painted blocks were color covered with the regular floor canvas of the day. Our school was almost ready. A few homemade desks were put in, but the biggest need was a blackboard. There was one in Blue Cove, left by an American teacher who had previously been there. On March 2nd, I celebrated my eighth birthday. On March 3rd, Miss Hepsi Wells, who was to be our teacher, and I walked over the ice to Blue Cove to pick up that blackboard. It could be rolled up and easily carried. When we reached home, my dad and the blacksmith nailed it to the bedroom wall, and on the following day, I had my first day in school. What a thrilling experience for me, but maybe not so thrilling for my mom. With 13 or 14 children going up over the stairs daily and again down to our kitchen when needing a drink of water. Our outdoor toilets served the school population too. I often wonder how mom even survived. <laughs> Luckily, she had a maid. The teacher and I shared the same bedroom. During our second year at Plum Point, a house was floated from Brig Bay down to Plum Point. It was on the beach there at Plum Point for some time. During the summer, we, the children, used it for a playhouse. Sometime during the early fall, a patch of land was cleared, and the house was hauled in from the beach and set up for a school. A road to the building was also cleared, and school began. The teacher was Miss Cora Sampson from Big Bay. She, too, lived with us. Both Hepsi and Cora had only a fifth grade five education. However, they were able to help us. In those days, very few students finished high school. When girls were around 13, they went out working as housemaids, or servant girls, as they were called. Many of the boys, too, quit school around the same age and went into the woods working with their fathers, either cutting pulpwood or logs for sawing lumber. Some families had their own sawmills. A higher education was not necessary unless they were planning to go into some profession, like the ministry, teaching, nursing, or becoming a doctor. Other surprises. One day during our first winter at Plum Point, I was taken over to a neighbor to spend the day. After a while, I wanted to go home, but they told me I would have to stay a little while longer, and then one of the girls would walk home with me. I was getting more and more anxious to go. Then some news came. A teacher on her way back home dropped in to tell me that I had a baby brother. I could hardly believe it. There was no baby there when I left home that morning. <laughs> Where in the world did the baby brother come from? <laughs> we had always been told that babies came from under the stump. There was an awful lot of snow around for digging to get a baby from under the stump. <laughs> I was really glad because now I had a brother and a sister. I had spent the first four years of my life alone. There was no church at Plum Point, so the minister at Flowers Cove came to our house, and my brother was christened in the kitchen of that bungalow. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thank you, Lorraine and Andrea, and thank you, Julie. Uh, have this, it's, a, it's poignant to consider what people can't see that follows, follows thereafter. Um, switching slightly uh, gears a little bit here and uh, talking a little more about songs. Uh, the International Woodworkers of America strike of 1959 was one of the most significant events in the history of the commercial woods industry. It was, in many ways, the culmination of decades of struggle by woods workers for decent wages and working conditions. 
In the late 1950s, frustrated with the lack of progress by their own union, workers chose the IWA to, re to represent them. Then Premier Joseph Smallwood, also from Gamba, refused to recognize the IWA. <laughs> well, that's a little delayed laugh there. <laughs> Refu Premier Smallwood refused to recognize the IWA and instead formed his own union, the Newfoundland Brotherhood of Woods Workers, and, as the stories go, offered various enticements, including Dole, for loggers and any others, to join. As Gary Payne, who collected the song, noted, the fee to join the NBWW was $3, and practically everybody joined except the loggers. <laughs> the IWA strike inspired many songs, including the one we are about to hear. The Brotherhood song was composed in 1959 by Edwin Payne, a logger from Pilly's Island, and it mocks the Smallwood-led recruitment for the NBWW. Jim Payne collected the lyrics in 1976 from Arthur Payne, his father, who was also Edwin Payne's brother. Here is Jim to perform his Uncle Ned's composition, The Brotherhood Song. So, um, this is probably the, the, the very first song that I ever actually remember hearing because it was sung a lot in the, in the family. Uncle Ned was actually my grandfather's brother, so he was actually my great uncle and Gary, uh, Gary, Gary's father, who would be my, my second uh, cousin. I wasn't going to mention the name of the place because I didn't want to out anybody here, but the, especially in light of the, you know, the news yesterday and so on, with what's going on in Gander and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, and I, you know, obviously didn't, at that age, growing up, I didn't really understand all the, the details, but as I grew older and heard the stories about how, you know, my, I remember my father telling me that when they got to the camp, it was a big scramble to try to get the top bunks. Because if you got the bottom bunks, the lice would fall off the person up overhead and you'd have to deal. Seriously, I, no, I kid you not. This was, this was a, a consideration when they went into, uh, into the camps at the beginning of the, uh, of the season, you know. Uh, so it, it was, uh, and I mentioned earlier that I worked as a, as a, as a logger, a subcontracting logger. This was, and this was in the, in the 70s. And after a summer of that, that's how I ended up becoming a musician, really. <laughs> It made a lot more sense for you to me. Anyway, this is a song I always knew it as when Libby joined the Brotherhood. And my uncle Ned wrote the, the initial version. Around the community, there were several other verses uh, kind of composed by various people and added to it and so on. I'm just going to sing Uncle Ned's original version. It's far more gentle than some of the other stuff that was uh, actually written. And it's kind of interesting to me that there are verses here that sort of acknowledge the fact that, you know, you live in a small village and you have to sort of figure out a way to get along with people no matter what your difference is. Uh, anyway, it was this. Oh, when Livy joined the Brotherhood, she thought she was a man. She went up over Taylor's Hill, three dollars in her hand. She sent the message to Joey, and this is how it read. Joey, boy, we're scabbers, me and Jim and Fred. <laughs> When Joey got the message, his heart was filled with joy because he heard from Livy and Fred, her darling boy. He sent the message right away and said, God bless your soul. Don't worry about Jim and Freddy. We'll keep them on the dole. Now Freddy's hauling wood one day, he's hauling it uphill. His horse's shoulders blistered and they're getting sore as hell. He'll never get his wood off if conditions they don't change. He cursed till he was tongue-tied up on the Gulpon range. Now Jimmy, when he stays at home, he's thinking pretty good. All about the good old days when he joined the Brotherhood. Things were pretty poor that year, which no one could control. So Joey, he got on the air and he whacked them out the dole. Now here's the good old Livy. She's leaving here today. She's going to get a blind pension, I heard somebody say. 
She's been with us quite a while. We're sad to see her go. But she'll be back again someday. We wish her cheerio. Now to conclude and finish, I know you'll all agree. In 1959, loggers lost their liberty. Joey, he got on the air and he did roar and shout. He brought the bloody gangsters in and he drove the angels out. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Woods workers made little distinction between songs, recitations, and poems. Sometimes a recitation was called a song, sometimes a song became a recitation. The choice oftentimes depended on the singing ability of the composer or the performer. In the tradition of the time, many longer poems were recited from memory, not read. Recitations were often humorous and tended to have a stronger and more dramatic narrative line than many of the songs and poems. As the 20th century progressed, Locally composed recitations became fewer and fewer, but a small number of storytellers have maintained and revitalized this tradition, including popular contemporary reciters Dave Padden, Dave Penny, Harry Ingram, and Hubert Fury, who sometimes performed together as the recitation troupe from stage to stage. We are very pleased to have with us today award-winning reciter, author, and storyteller Hubert Fury of Harbor, Maine. In 2017, Hubert pu published a collection of his writings entitled, As the Old Folks Would Say. His recitation, Going in the Woods, beautifully recalls the images, sounds, patterns, and language of the time-honored tradition of woodcutting for family fuel. Here is Hubert to recite Going in the Woods, one of 14 recitations in the book. Tell you the truth, if I didn't know I was going to have to do this, I wouldn't have written the recitation. <laughs> uh, tell me what to say, dear. In the woods, uh, when we were growing up, when we were growing up, if my son was here now, he'd say, was that before or after the First World War, Dad? <laughs> Uh, we didn't hear the men say, I'm going to cut wood tomorrow, going in the woods. Didn't mean you were hunting, didn't mean you were going trouting or anything like that, you are going to cut wood, in the woods. So that's what I've entitled my recitation, In the Woods. If I have to uh, refer to my book every now and then, it means that I haven't done one of these in a while, and of course, you can see by the grey hair, I'm getting old and wanting another. But a funny story about the book. Sometimes, you know, you'll be reciting away and somebody will laugh and you'll lose it. And you have to look at the book to pick it up. And I was at the LSPU Hall and this lady was following my wife down the stairs and she said, now she said, when your husband, she said, looks at the book like that, that's part of his act, isn't it? <laughs> and my devoted wife, of course. <laughs> In the woods. By the way, I just want to tell you one little thing about gaps because that's the very first word you're going to hear is gaps. Gaps weren't just, and I don't want to be in the definition here, but uh, the, every, every square inch of land in those days was fenced. And of course you had the traditional wood paths. And what you did across the wood path, you put two stakes so that they were separated, and then two more stakes across from them separated, so you could slide a rail back and forth. So in the fall of the year, you could just slide off the rails and the gaps were down, not open. The gaps were down because the gap, we thought, we, we called the gap the actual rail that, that slid. Okay. In the woods. In the woods. <laughs> By the way, this is the way uh, it was going out as I was turning a teenager. I, I did go in the woods a number of times with my stepfather, uh, but it was pretty well going. Uh, as, as I got into my later teens, you know. Uh, so, uh, what I remember is what's in this poem. The gaps are down. The ground is froze. The wood pets choked with snow. It's up in the dark to tackle the horse as into the woods they go. 
Oats bag, hay bag, sharpened axe tied to a frosty seat. The grub bag has salt fish to roast, raisin bread, and molasses bread to treat. Up the marshes through open gaps, past houses still abed, each man the master of the day with catamaran and sled. With chirp and taunt, impatient click, they urge the horses on, following the time-worn beaten paths crossed bog and marsh and pond. Honed cold steel of runners smooth make a harsh and grating sound as horses strain with snorting strength to tame the frozen ground. The rhythmic beat of well-shot hooves from every horse and mare make music with the jangling bells in the frosty, steamy air. But there's no rush. There's time to talk and yearn and gossip too. Pass the news, torment and taunt the laggard in the crew. <laughs> There's many a laugh, a jibe, a joke, there might even be a song. They wonder if old Tom is ill that he didn't come along. On mornings when the snow is deep and mounting drifts hold sway, the, tra the long trail in has to be cleared. They'll just beat the path that day. So it's every horse a turn up front, and when old Jack's tired out, another horse steps in the lead and takes his turn about. And so it goes. Half, horse after horse makes a hardened road, a beaten path made slick by sleds to easy haul the load. But there'll be no wood cut that day. Both horse and man are spent. They'll just mug up in the woods and come back the way they went. Up in earnest the second day, and every day they're on, through the drook, past Hicks's, hunt, Hicks's hump, skirting Whalen's pond. The pinch is hard and southern point tests the driver's skill. Cross George's marsh, along the track to tackle Saddle Hill. The way is smooth down the other side, with third pond on the right. Past Murner's naps its even ground, with the snuff box now in sight. Another hill, another bog, the barrens yet to cross. Everything's gone well so far, there's been no slip or loss. Dawn gives way to daylight strong, though the wind is sharp and cold. But at long last the barrens end and they watch the woods unfold. Blacky boys and old black spruce, scaly ver and birch, whitens to make kindling serve white as the painted church. So now they're here, and in a grove, hard at work in a grove by Jordan's Pond. And it's cut and saw, limb and haul, work hard as the days wear on. No need to tether the faithful horse, he's got his bag of hay, his oats bag resting alongside. He'll not stray far away. Most times they're cutting firewood, the driest they can find, and rails, of course, for fences in the spring, and stakes that they can rind. Saplings make a picket fence, lungers to build flakes. Good boat knees, good knees for boat sterns will be found whatever time it takes. In days gone by, they cut the logs for house, stable and shed. Everything came from the woods, every table, chair and shed. Prime logs were taken to a mill powered by a waterfall. In one small place, the logs they cut built the parish hall. Well, the morning's on and they've worked hard. It's time to take a spell. Axe and saw are laid aside as they hear the welcome yell. Come on, boys, it's mug up time. Put the piper kettle on. Get some water to brew the tea. Cut a hole in Biggin's pond. Wrap salt fish from the old grub bag in brown paper, sapping wet. Throw it in upon the fire. No, it, it's not ready yet. The wet brown paper has to burn then the fish is cooked just right. They just can't wait with watering mouths to, for that first delicious bite. While they dine, the saucy jays pitch right at their feet, chattering in their irksome way to beg a little treat. What's left of the molasses bread will be their midday meal. They're company, company enough around the fire, but watch them close, they steal. <laughs> a leisured smoke, they roll their own, perhaps another tea. 
Then empty the kettle to douse the fire, they have to leave a tree. Back to work, cut more sp spruce, the, road, the load is not yet done. Then it's heave and haul and stow it on to beat the setting sun. I'm waiting. <laughs> Tauten the rope with bitten sticks. You know what a bitten stick is? Bitten sticks. Bitten sticks, you have a stick of wood where you can't haul the rope tight enough because you're just not that strong. So you take a sh smaller stick, twist it around, and hold it back, and that's how you tighten the load. Tighten the, ro the load with bitten sticks. No precious wood slides out. Harness the horse, tackle the horse between the shafts, it's time to be moving out. Both horse and man attack the path with a much more leisured pace. At that time of day, with a full load on, no need to rush or race. Back at home, unload the wood, stack it in a pile. Blanket the horse in his welcome stall, there'll be supper in a while. Eat your fill, heave back a bit, early hit the hay. At that time of year, except for storms, they'll cut wood every day. That's the way it was, going in the woods in days now so long gone. They knew the name of every hill, every bog marsh, every pond. From the time the ice formed on the ponds till it melted in the spring, it was in the woods, hear the horses snort and the jangling sleigh bells ring. Thank you. Thank you, Hubert, that was wonderful. Our conversations and collaborative research have uncovered many fascinating personal accounts, archival photographs, and songs relating to Wood's work. One thread of this research that has continued to resonate is that of the wartime forester units of the Newfoundland, um, the Newfoundland Forestry Corps of the First World War and the Newfoundland Overseas Forestry Unit of the Second World War. In all, during both wars, over 4,000 men enlisted in the NFC and NOFU to cut timber for, to support the British war effort. Although most of the logger, Newfoundland loggers who went overseas stayed less than two years before returning home, their cultural legacies and exchanges were part of transnational cultural ripples created by war and migration that have continued to resonate. In 2015, we collaborated with the Ballader Historic Forestry Project Association in Ballader, Aberdeenshire, Scotland, to document the story of the Newfoundland foresters and to develop this traveling multimedia exhibit to tell the stories of the lives of the foresters and the women who became their war brides and also contributed greatly to our province in their own ways. This exhibit will tour Newfoundland and Labrador, and a duplicate will tour the northeast of Scotland over the coming years. As you can see, the exhibit has six panels arranged in chronological order that include an overview, recruitment, overseas travel, work in the United Kingdom, life in the UK, and the post-war era, respectively. The iPad kiosk enables users to explore archival and new recordings of songs, recitations, and stories by loggers. There are six featured items, including a new version of the Badger Drive, recorded by Jim Payne and Fergus O'Byrne, Ron Hines' version of uh, Tickle Cove Pond, recorded in 1991, a recording by Clara Doyle of, uh, of NOFU member Angus Temple's poem, Convoy to Scotland, and a short documentary film entitled A Bygone Forest about the Glenmuick camp at Dalmachie, Camp 49, near Ballader, Scotland, which tells the story of the NOFU at Ballader during the Second World War. You will also hear an archival recording of Billy the Lumberman, sung by Lander Peach, about NOFU member William Sully and his Scottish war bride, Mary Gardner, who returned with him to Heart's Delight, Trinity Bay, in 1945. Finally, you can listen to a version of the Forester's Song, the only song we have found that was written by foresters about their service overseas, the soundtrack for a photo slideshow featuring the communities and woodworkers of the southern shore of Newfoundland. The Forester song was written by James Carew of, Pat Bro of Cape Broyle and Patrick Carew of Admiral's Cove. It was arranged and recorded by Pamela Morgan for mentioned in song. We now present this song and slideshow as an introduction to the exhibit, which, uh, which we invite you to take a closer peek at at the end of our program. Test the German foe. Our wives 
and sweethearts they did mourn as they stood on the pier, lamenting for the ones they loved. And they shed many a tear. I say now, boys, you are called upon to go and do your part, as Newfoundlanders always did, and we shall make a start. So cheer up, boys, and do your best while you are far away, and you'll come back a credit to your countrymen someday. It was for England in January from Babel's we did sail on a liner bound for English shore. We gave a hearty cheer. The passengers did line her deck, and on us they did smile, saying, "Here's to the boys from Fairyland, and some more from Old Cape Royal." Not forgetting Whitless Bay and Babel's too, likewise, and Bonnie Little Calvert sent forth her darling boys. We're not forgetting Tors Cove and Mobile in our song for all the boys who did come forth to answer duty's call. There's one who comes from old Vermeus who says he's not afraid. Young Thomas Tobin was his name, a fisherman by trade. He bade adieu unto his friends as he left home that day, saying, "When I will return again, you will have in your hay." Stepped on board of her, all hailed from St. John's Town, commanded by Captain Turner, who never wore a frown. Saying, "I am going with the boys, as I have done before, to show the spirit of the men from Terra Nova shore." There's Torbay too included, who nobly did their part. They left their sweethearts on the shore, all with a broken heart. We're not forgetting the northern men, the mainstay of our land, the finest crowd of lumbermen that ever left the strand. In Scotland, before returning home. So, boys, don't be downhearted while crossing o'er the main. There's lots of girls in Scotland to cheer you up again. Now we're gliding o'er the sea. The land is drawing nigh. A sharp lookout for German ships is watched by every eye. So thanks be to kind Providence, we've landed safe on land, and we dance the stack of barley and stepped out on the strand. Now we're seated on the trains, some heaved a heavy sigh. The girls stood at the station as we were passing by. They brought us lunch and gave us tea and took us by the hand. Saying you're welcome to this country from dear old Newfoundland.
uh, that concludes today's uh, event. Uh, thank you again to Ursula and Megan and all our wonderful performers who shared pieces today. Thank you to MMAP for the space and to Icer Books Publications Assistant Randy Drover for uh, organizing and planning this event. Thank you to you, everyone, for coming today uh, to help us celebrate. Please stay, um, enjoy some refreshments in the hall, take a closer look at the exhibit, and don't forget to pick up a copy of the book. Thank you. Thank you.